This is High School Not So Much a Musical, a podcast that takes you on a ride through the peaks and valleys of a high school journey. Here are your presenters, Nitin Jaladanki and Ayush Agarwal. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of High School Not So Much a Musical. Today we are joined with Miss Brooke Yaokam, who is a child entrepreneur and has started her own business, Gift Pocket, at a very young age. So, uh, Brooke, if you could talk to us a little bit about your entrepreneurial venture, especially as a teen and running your own business in college, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. First of all, I just want to say thank you guys so much for having me on today. And yeah, you kind of hit on the spot. I was, I'm a child entrepreneur. I guess I still am. I'm, I'm 19 now, but I started Gift Pocket when I was 12 years old. And like most 12 years old, 12 year olds, you just, you face a lot of problems that don't seem that significant, but after a while you want to solve it. And every single Christmas, my grandfather would give me gift cards to stores that I would never shop at. And I um, participate in the Young Entrepreneurs Academy. And they're like, what's a problem you think you can solve? I thought apps were made in days. I had no idea what computer science was, but I was like, I'm going to solve this gift card problem and inspire the idea of gift pocket. All your gift cards on your phone, pay with them in stores or online. You get a gift card you don't like. You can exchange it for one that you do. And now you can send gift cards on the app. And, you know, you're probably like, Brooke, you started this when you're 12 and you're 19 years old. Like, what's up? And you're like, gift pocket is a fintech app. When you exchange a gift card, you get GP points. And when you, um, you can use those points to buy a new gift card and, Um, in order to avoid money transmitter laws and achievement laws there's a lot of different like partnerships that we had to build and different things to do and you know that took a long time especially as a 12 year old 12 years old 12 year old in the gift card industry as well to add we are um you know transitioning to um you know add more on to gift pocket because there's a lot of big opportunities with brands and leveraging our wallet to help brands expand their gift card um loyalty programs and so doing a lot of different unique stuff. I, I, I don't want to like kind of hog the conversation and just kind of go on for an hour, but happy to kind of, um, you know, answer any more of your questions. Yeah, definitely. So um, one of the things that I wanted to do or ask you, ask you was what, inve- what incentivized you to start at like such a young age? You could have had, you could have had this idea and just like could have held on to it for a really long time. And But how were you exactly able to gather the resources and time to like sit down where you have to focus on school and what incentivized you to start working on your business at, at such a young age rather than holding on to the idea for like a couple more years until you were like out of high school? I think my whole life I knew I had a purpose to do something bigger than just, you know, I loved math. Don't get me wrong. I loved just my science classes, but I was unfulfilled and I feel like there was a bigger purpose for me out there and when I had the opportunity to start my own business I felt like that was my purpose I felt like all these times I just stare at the the smart board or stare at the screen like yeah I was learning but I wasn't learning for my future and I feel like you know who cares if gift pocket fails that was my classroom that is where I learned who I am today and so I think I saw that opportunity, you know, maybe to make it a successful company, but to finally pursue the real person that I actually was. Okay, and just really quickly, because this really re- relates to like what I did. How exactly did you go about finding the funding to like get your business started? Because when I had to like start, I started my business when I was 14, so a little bit older than you were. But I the only reason that I got funding was because I was able to pitch to like a group of VCs. And it was through like this pitching competition. So how did you go and get funding for your idea? Because obviously developing the computer code and starting a fintech startup was not that easy. So how exactly did you acquire the funding for it? Um, I would uh, pitch competitions in the beginning and then we've been self-funded to this point, but it's, it's super hard to raise money as someone who is still in school just because people you know, they're always like, are you not as focused? So I would say doing a lot of pitch competitions is super helpful or building a team so that people see that like there's people around you that believe in your idea. And um, I'm going to continue to, I'm raising money right now and I'm going to continue to do it in um, next year. I just, it's just really hard. At, yeah, I mean, when you're starting your own business, it's not like you wear one hat one day and the next, like, you're wearing multiple hats and it's constantly changing. Like, you know, one day I'm leading marketing, one day I'm leading the technology, one day I'm leading raising money, one day I'm leading the hiring people. So it's just hard trying to do it all while also being a student. So I definitely say pitch competitions are super helpful because, you know, 
you would take an hour out of your day, you pitch, you either walk away with a couple thousand dollars or you don't. And then just, you know, it's practice or you get money. It's just kind of one of those two things. So you started this idea or project when you were 12 years old. And for most 12 year, 12 year, 12 year olds, like computer programming and app development, it's kind of like out of their scope. So like, did you feel that, or did you have any help from anyone, you know, that was close to you? And do you think they had like a positive impact like on your life if they did end up helping you? Um, so just to give you, I, um, after two years of research development and wireframing, I hired developers because uh, it's too hard to um, be a student and code, and especially with the infrastructure we had to build because we had to um, integrate with multiple APIs and we have to build like a fraud prevention platform and stuff, all that. But um, yeah, no, I didn't know what computer science was. And I think it's definitely a foreign topic, especially when uh, where I was at, where like I didn't get like, I didn't grow up with like an iPad or anything like that. I, I grew up with like pencil and paper and like computer rooms, which you might guys probably don't even know, maybe. But um, yeah, no, I definitely think the I I think what kind of warmed me up to the idea of computer science was I, I used this thing called bus, Balsamic, and the new like the wireframing tool is Figma. But I used the OG Balsamic, which is like black black and white. Like I have like a thousand different screens, so I think. The idea of like, you know, like problem solving and like this button goes there. And then I used, um, oh shoot, I forget what it's called, but I used something to create like a fake like prototype where if you click this button, it takes you there. So I think doing that kind of stuff, learning those kind of tools, I forget what, if I remember the tool, I will say it. Um, it's like, it's awesome. Let me see if I can find it, but yeah. Okay, so that's, not, that's like really interesting because when I was going through the prototype stage of my a product i realized that like it's really really difficult to cater to like a specific audience right off the bat so i essentially had to pivot my business because so it, i was i was in an incubator so i had the i had around three weeks to create the my business idea and what i essentially started off with was like a stock investing platform for high schoolers but they realized that we're nobody to like give actual stock advice to high schoolers because and then we're just a group of high schoolers. We don't really have the time to cater specific information. And then that's when I actually pivoted to the idea that I ran with, which was a which was a high school drone education startup, with, which essentially helps high schoolers understand how to build and code and fly drones. So did you have that? Did you ever have to go through a pivot process of where you started off and you realized that this is just something that's completely out of my scope? And then you have to shift to a different idea or change like a specific part of your service or product? Yeah, that's a great point. One side note, it's called Franken Frankenware. It's what I use to make prototypes. Um, but yeah, no, I completely agree. I think I think pivoting is actually one of the best things in business because it's not accepting defeat. It's accepting the fact that you could do something better with your existing product or your existing knowledge. And so with Gift Pocket, um, you know, we have this awesome wallet where people can add gift cards on, but that's not really where the long-term revenue and opportunity is. The long-term revenue op and opportunity is with brands. So there's this biggest misconception that brands love gift cards. However, brands can't claim revenue on a gift card until it's actually spent. And um, so like brands miss out on like $3 billion worth of revenue each year. But when someone spends a gift card on average, they'll spend $59 more than the value of that gift card. And so these gift cards are such a huge, like loyal type of customer that comes into these stores, but brands aren't legally allowed to know who their gift card holders are. So we can connect brands to their gift card holders as well for like super small businesses. We can give them a whole new stream to sell gift cards digitally. And so I think we realized that let's use our awesome wallet, but let's use it in a more beneficial way to help brands and bring in more revenue and bring in ways that can bring us more users through like ways that we don't even have to pay for. And so I think there's a difference between like pivoting and the, or giving up or like, yeah, like pivoting, giving up or just like evolving. And I think, you know, like human life, we've evolved from, you know, being like chimps because that's what was best for, you know, the new stage of life. I started Gift Pocket, you know, seven years ago and let's be real digital payments weren't a thing then but now digital payments are huge and that's such a normal thing and so i think seven years ago people weren't ready for gift pocket but i think people are ready for it today definitely yeah and i think another thing to keep in mind for the listeners is like listening to brooke talking you can kind of see the amount of in-depth market research she's done on gift cards and how the whole digital payment process industry works in general for example she talked about like three billion dollars worth of 
losses for companies because of gift cards every year. So that kind of uh, sets the pace for how much market research you have to do, especially when you're at like an executive level position in order to ensure that you have an adequate understanding of how your business is going to perform in the future at all times. So Brooke, if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the importance of doing market research um, and how that can really, really help set a company's uh, business strategy and like how you kind of approached your market research for gift pocket in order to uh, like maximize earnings essentially. Yeah, I'll, t I'll, I'll forewarn, you can only do a certain amount of market research and then there comes a point where you just kind of have to like test it in the real market. And I think my market research first started like, let's look up the statistics. I think the first thing is like, what's your total market, total of uh, TAM, total of uh, accessible market. So like how big is the market? Like how big, how many get people gift cards are people buying? How many gift cards are going unspent? And so you know, gift card industry is supposed to be like $221 billion in 2023. And that's not even including how big gift cards have gotten through the pandemic. So it's probably going to probably be like 250 billion. So like, that's a huge number. Then, you know, there's probably like $50 billion worth of gift cards that haven't been used yet. And each year, 3% of gift cards go unused, which is probably more now. And so like, you just, you kind of have to like, look at the big numbers. You're like, wow, like, is this industry big? Is it okay? And then what are you, what's your competition? What, what, what are they doing? And like, I think the thing is, is like, you know, you can always be like, okay, I'm going to do this better, but like, okay, but like, how are you going to stand out? Or sometimes is there no competition? And that's either a good thing because then you start your own market or it could be a bad thing because that means it's just not a product that really the market wants. And so you have to look at your competition and then you have to talk to customers. And I think that's one thing that we've like, always have to do it's not like one day you're going to talk to your customer and then two years later they have that same opinion no tomorrow, they could change their opinion within a week or the next week or they and so i think that talking to your customers seeing what they want seeing what they need and also seeing what they will pay for because everyone can be like oh i want this but i won't pay for it and then you're screwed and that's the same thing with brands and customers and so i think understanding that but i also think sometimes like you have to like go like okay well the brand will be like yeah we want this but we want to see proof that it works and so you have to go build out a case study and so i think sometimes research is really is really important for the beginning but at some point you just kind of have to hit the market and then continue to do market research while you're in like your prototyping or mvp phase because you like at some point you just have to like test it see what's working okay we got to do this like pivoting like Pivoting also comes with research and understanding what's going on in the market. And just, you know, sometimes you make mistakes, but that's just life. Yeah, yes. I totally oh. agree because like when it comes to doing market research, one thing that I personally found was that the reason that we won the whole pitching competition was that we didn't have much idea on like the real impact that we were going to make. We didn't emphasize on that. What we did emphasize on was the actual like, um, survey results that we did and then we did a survey of almost like 350 people compared to like the others who did a survey of maybe like 15 people and out of those 350 people what we found was that like 95 percent of them have either flown a drone or crashed it which showed us that people know how what drones are and how they work but they don't know exactly how to fly them and why they fly the way that they do and then the, just to give you like a sort of understanding of like the whole startup as a whole we want to bring drone education to like the high school market because the current problem is that m most of like the drones that the high schoolers set their hands on so like the dji or the parrot they're all kind of drones that are already pre-built and all you do is learn how to fly them and learning how to fly isn't even that big of a deal but understanding how they're flying and why they're flying allows the, the student as a whole to, to maybe modify the drone to a way that makes it easier for them to fly. So the whole idea behind Comet Drones, which is the name of the company, is just kind of bringing that drone education market with a unique combination of like a drone kit and the course to like bring it to the upcoming generation of mechanical engineers. And the reason that market research is so important is that you can have a great idea for a product, but there's just no need for it once it comes to the market which is why a lot of these products fail and if you go on shark tank you're gonna find thousands of great great products that 
serve some kind of need, but they don't serve like a customer need. They don't serve a need that thousands of people need it for. So that's just a quick thing that I wanted to touch on. Rishi, I cut you off there. Anything that you want to add on? Yeah. So on that note of market research, you started this when you were 12 and you mentioned that you did like research and like market research for two years. So about when you were 15 or 14, you said you started to hire um, uh, like workers to help you develop and build this app. And this goes into my next question. Like, did you ever feel that like your age, you know, you being so young, like having this um, business and this app, do you think it was ever like detrimental to like, uh, your ethos you could say like um do you feel did you feel that like it would be weird you know being 15 or 14 years old hiring workers or that like people older than you they wouldn't want to listen to you about your idea because you were so young um i feel like there's a lot of ways i can go about answering this question i think the first thing that i will say is when i was 15 picking developers i I didn't know who to pick and I didn't know, like if someone was like, it's going to cost $500,000 to make this app, I would have been like, okay, that's, that sounds like right. Because I didn't know like left from right. And so I think the first thing was like, I felt in a way that I would, we like the people on our team at the time, we, like, cause we were really new to start, like, especially being in like the app space. I think we were at first, like, you know, like obviously people were, it worked be out to go more on the talk taken seriously but like people were giving us like sows like um like um how much it would cost to do it and they were outrageous prices and eventually we got lowest prices but i think that's the one thing that when you first start your business you really need to get someone some advice from someone who knows the space you can't like have like my mom my dad huge business owners like they know that they know their industry but they've never started their own app before so you need to talk to someone who's been in the app space to be like or get a cto that's why it's so important to have a cto like this is th what should be normal or have like a, like get uh, someone to code it but yeah no i definitely think there's been certain times and less now that i've gotten older where like you know certain email chains have gone about where like I'm not on it or like I'm not invited to the meetings or like people will show up late or like I remember like I was I, I think the thing is is when it's your like your product and you're like you're the entrepreneur like it's your child and like so I had a very particular vision about how I wanted the app to look because I had gone through many iterations of wireframing and so after I I've done like literally a thousand wireframes. I was like, I know the app needs to work this way. If it's literally not impossible, we're going to do it this way. Like, I'll take creative, you know, I'll take, I'll take, you know, I need feedback. You can't be like one track mind, but like, I was very, you know, I, I know what I wanted because I did a lot of research and this one developer was like, no, I don't like it. And he like d said it behind my back. And I, it's so childish. And th that was our sign that we, we weren't going to work with them. But, you know, I think sometimes people like, you know, they think that they know better just because they're older than me, but no one really knows the gift card space unless, you, unless you've been in it for a while. No one knows the app space unless you've been in it for a while. And no one knows the teenage demographic because the teenage demographic is always changing because, you know, teenagers are only a teenager for six years. So I think, you know, like let everyone bring their own different background and trust what they have to say. If you have legitimate reasoning for, you know, your opinion, then say it. But like, you know, just because we are young, it doesn't mean our opinions and what we're having to say isn't valuable because I'm making an app for teenagers. Who's going to know this demographic better than me? Teenagers, no one else. Thank you, Brooke, for your amazing insight on the life of a student entrepreneur. For our listeners, make sure to check out Brooke's company, Gift Pocket, and also make sure to check out the second part of this two-part series, which will be released next Friday. Thank you all, and see you next time. High School Not So Much A Musical is hosted by Ayush Agarwal and Nitin Jaladanki. Narration by Samhit Padala. Music from Louis Luang Relaxation Cafe, Tune Pocket, and Infraction. If you like the show, please recommend it to your friends and family. Thank you for listening, and see you next time.